All right, Josh, what's up, man? Oh, Justin, man, just you and I. I mean, excited for our call today. We both of us in Austin. We could probably do this in person, but I mean, you know, we're both busy guys. So, you know, we're here to be able to kind of have some fun, right? Yeah, well, we probably should be doing it in person. And I am building a uh, bigger studio that is going to be um you know that that can accommodate that with you know kind of an operator that that uh can run point while you know you got two people there so Dude, that's exciting I'm looking yeah forward to it. it's kind of the the new path so i'm i'm looking to uh team up with uh one of my friends brad weimer who we were talking about uh off air here and uh we're gonna have a, a studio an office we're gonna do some uh you know kind of work together in this really cool part of town that I think has uh, potential to be just an awesome uh, little nook of kind of the east side. Damn, I love it. I, I almost feel like we should switch the conversation. I want to start interviewing you about the new project. I <laughs> uh, love it. Well, this is just, you know, we're in the early stages, but uh, there's so much opportunity with like, you know, so number one, Austin's so vibrant where yeah. one of the things that we could do is we can build out, you know, an office space in an existing building that's there. Uh, we could entitle the land. We could sell it to a developer down the road. I mean, there's so much opportunity and it's so close that it's, you know, someone's going to want to build multiple stories on the spot. Um, yeah. So kind of cool. Yeah, man, that's awesome. I mean, it's funny, Brad, myself, and one of our other friends, Henry Fuentes, had talked about doing something this similar like eight years ago. So I'm glad that someone's actually finally, you and him are finally taking it to fruition because it's so needed. Yeah, we, we've talked about it for a while and uh, glad we found what we think is the perfect spot. So early stages, so we'll see. Uh, but man, I'm just excited to hang. You know, you and I, uh, actually, I feel like I want to share the the funny story of how <laughs> you and I met uh, because, you know, I'm, I'm like this total novice, total rookie. I don't know anything about the online space. Uh, I, I literally like I went to my very first traffic and conversion uh, conference uh, out in San Diego, which is one. it's the biggest online marketer, you know, online business owner uh, conference out there. And uh, Brian Dice started the company, partnered up with some other people. So I show up, I think there were 6,000 people here this year. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think I'm like, you know, probably number 6,000, maybe 5,999 <laughs> in terms of like knowledge and expertise in anything online. Um, and so I remember sitting there at the beginning and you know, I'm listening to this speaker and they're talking about some stuff and then another speaker. And I remember leaning over to a total stranger. I hadn't met, you know, my friends were there in a different session. And I, I had just heard people talking about this word copy. And I'm like, what the heck is copy? Like copy, paste, copy, like, are you <laughs> copying something? And so I leaned over to this total stranger and I was like, hey, psst, um, what does copy mean? And, uh, you know, this guy was so nice and he's like, oh yeah, it's like the words that you have on your website or it's, you know, the words used in your email sequence or what, you know, and so I was like, oh, this is making so much sense, but that's how much of a novice I was, yeah. Josh, I didn't even know the most basic thing there. And after hearing that word enough times, I'm like, all right, I got to figure this out. Um, so kind of fun to be in that space. I like to be oh, yeah. a total amateur, right? Oh, like yeah. I just... I love going into rooms where everyone's smarter than me. It forces me to learn, forces me to, you know, re really kind of up level. Uh, but here's the funny story of how you and I met. So I don't know you from anyone. Uh, I'm walking down, you know, one of the their, their main corridor. Yeah. Uh, this is actually, I think this is the lobby of, of the hotel oh, that the convention center is tied to. And uh, I look at you and then I walk by and I was like, wait a minute. I think I know him. I think he works out at my gym. And that's what you had, said to me. Right? This had to be the most <laughs> random conversation. Some guy you don't know that's like, hey, do you work out at the same gym as me? I mean, you probably thought I was crazy. And uh, what a what a funny situation uh, to be kind of put in, right? Dude, it was it was funny because I'm sitting up there, you know, seriously, like you said. And I can't remember. Did I have, did I have the man bun then or did I have the, the top... Uh, more mohawk now. I can't remember, but 
Yeah, I think it was a little more more man bun ish. You may have been in the the top knot, kind of longer hair, kind of going through. You had longer hair for sure. Yep. It's funny because you know so many people were like, "Oh, I recognize you from the hair and things like that," and you're like, "Oh, I'm like, cool, bro. It's nice to meet you." I'm like, "Okay, stalker." I'm like, "What's (laughs) going on?" We, you know, in the social media world, we we get so many people like, "Oh, I think I know you," kind of situation. And the funny thing is, Justin, so many times and my wife finally believes me now that she's seen it so many times, I'll be at different random events, things like that. But like, oh, my God, hey, do I know you? And I must just have like one of those faces. But and so that's kind of where when you and I first met, I kind of took it like, All right, yeah, just another guy thinks he knows me. And then we got back to us and I'm like, oh, you really do work here. <laughs> yeah, it was just hysterical. And, you know, I'm never really shy about going up to people. I don't care about embarrassing myself. And at that point in time, I just I didn't know you were a big deal. I didn't know that so many people in that space knew you that, you know, people were always trying to get your attention. So I totally get that, uh, that some random strangers like, hey, man, we work out in the same gym. Uh, but then it was really funny. And I saw you and I was like, hey, Josh, uh, what's up? You know, uh, and you're like, oh, you do work hey. out here. <laughs> and you recommended amazing wine place to me in Italy. I mean, like, it, and my wife and I even went there at our, for our, you know, when we got married. I mean, it was like so many cool things that happened from one event. And I think, dude, I mean, the big lesson from that is, I mean, Justin, look where you are at today. I mean, compared to, I mean, you were a big deal in your own right there. But for even in our industry, our world, how you've been able to rise, though, I think most of people need to take advantage of. How often is to be able to walk up to a stranger, get rid of what we hold on to, what they're going to say? And dude, I mean, it's it's worked out well and it's built an amazing friendship between you and I since. Yeah, I, I just have loved our time. We got a chance to pump some iron together. We got a chance to play volleyball, uh, you know, pending some injuries that you and I have each had in, in different <laughs> realms. Uh, you know, it's it's been uh, it's been really fun. And oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I just love the random stories of how you can meet people and how friendship can evolve. And this for me is, you know, and I guess probably for you too, is one of the funniest or most interesting ways of it. But uh, like you, I um, I feel like I'm a doppelganger, right? So people are always like, hey, I, you know, uh, you look familiar. You look like my friend, you know, Joe or Bill or, you know, whoever. Uh, so I think it's really funny. Um that you know one of these actually works out and it's uh yeah. it's gone the distance because we share a lot of values some some shared commonalities in like family you know we've got kids you're part of front row dads yeah. uh you're in austin we uh, have many mutual friends and and it's kind of fun seeing for me as this rookie who knew nothing about the online space now i live in it right like now i actually uh you know i mean technically i'm still not really on social media much my team is but <laughs> um, you, you know, the, the reality, and, and I'm sure I'm falling short. Like you're probably looking at my stuff and you're like, oh my goodness, if only Justin could figure this out, or we got to let his team know this. But, uh, you know, the reality is like, I didn't have a website. I didn't have, um, you know, like any copy, I didn't have anything. And, you know, you just fast forward a few years and the difference that that makes that education that I got meeting people like you, um, and not just what you have shared, what you have taught, but also who you've connected me with, who we have uh, shared as mutual connections or who we've referred to one another and how that's really helped support each of our businesses. It's it's fun to be in community and help each other grow the things that they're passionate about. 100%, Justin. I mean, and that, I think it goes all back to relationships, right? You and I pride ourselves on being able to have powerful relationships and be that person on the other side that actually holds that space. And I think so many people in the online world, like you're talking about, they don't know those things. They jump from connecting with someone, then trying to pitch them. And then they're, they're trying to be able to grow their business that way. And I mean, I think a lot of people, and I hope everyone listening pays attention. One of the biggest core things that I always go through is it has to start off with a conversation, right? You and I had a conversation at TNC. Conversations build relationships. Relationships create opportunity. And I mean, that's the way that you have to be able to go about it. And you and I hold those values to be so true. And I think it's allowed, I mean, I've been, I started my first company in 2003 with, you know, a company that most people forgot about these days, MySpace, right? Like they were my first client. My wife always goes, whenever you tell that story, it makes you sound old. I'm like, I am in my 40s. So it's, it's okay. You know, it kind of goes through. But 
But you MySpace was cool because you could pick your own music. People could show up to your profile. You had your own song on there. You had everything. Well, then it also <laughs> hurt a lot of people because we started, you know, going back through. I mean, you remember. I mean, like we try and customize our pages and stuff like that. And you're like, shit, I broke it all. But like throughout that whole time frame, man, I mean, the reason I've been around for as long as I have is based on the relationships first. How do we actually build that value and then allow other opportunities to be created? I mean, dude, that's that's why you and I are having this conversation right now because of it. Yeah, yeah. So, so fun when, you know, and I want to dive into all your businesses and, and you know, your experience there. It's just so fun when um, I always say I like being able to to do life together, to to live life, you know, with people and, and to be able to do business with friends and to have friendships form from business. But if we can keep that ecosystem tight and then constantly introduce people to other things and then. Uh, what ends up happening is the lifestyle starts to bleed in and you start hanging out socially. And, you know, like you guys went to my favorite winery or, or, you know, uh, you know, the spot, you know, it's, I mean, restaurant winery. I mean, it's a, a true <laughs> full blown operation, uh, which is towards you the have an hour long conversation just around, you know, the food that was there. So no you know, a, a lasagna that just blows your mind. And everyone's like, wait a minute, where, what are you guys talking about? Where? <laughs> it's just the most epic experience. I mean, that truly is today still my favorite wine experience I've ever had. Uh, they just did it right. You know, so yeah. Torciano, if you haven't been, it's uh, just a really cool place in, in Tuscany. Uh, check it out. Um, so let's talk about some of your early businesses. Uh, how, how did you get into the entrepreneurial world? And then what was the, I guess, the process, the you know, you've had several different businesses that you've been involved with. So how did you land where you are now? Dude, that's a good question. I mean, a lot of trial and error, right? A lot of falling down, being able to go through it. It's funny. I think I got lucky in the beginning because, you know, I had been here in Austin and I had got my broker's license and then the lender had asked me, they're like, hey, I mean, this is back in 2000. Uh, you know, can you move out of California, open office out here? And it's funny, like I went out there and I think I saw the writing on the wall before most people for what 2008 was going to be, because it was kind of a whole, like people were running, I, I would say they were running over their own grandmother to close a loan, right? I mean, because they were putting people in negams, reverse mortgages, people were buying their house for 300 and now they owed 900,000 or a million on their home. And it's like, you're going the wrong way. So I jumped out of that industry and I had a buddy of mine that was like, hey, this is 2002. 2003, beginning of that. And he's like, Hey, in this online world, you want to come in, you know, help us out. And it was an, it was interesting because back then you couldn't get into the digital space unless you knew someone, Justin. So, you know, for me, I kind of got in and I, I learned a real, a big lesson very quickly. The owner of that company tried to change from business owner to business operator. And there's a huge difference in the two. And most people don't understand the difference. And for him, he was better as an owner when he tried to get into the company after he'd already stepped away, where most of us want to move from business operator to business owner. He went the reverse, shut down the entire company. And so I, I remember getting a call and they were like, I told my, my girlfriend at the time, I said, this company's going under, you know, this, it's, he's wanting to be able to get on a call tomorrow, the whole thing. And it kind of pushed me into going, all right, I'm going to take the relationships I have built and be able to take them forward. And that's kind of where MySpace came around. I just kind of happened to have the relationships with the people that were there and started monetizing traffic, seeing the opportunity of relationships. How do I actually help someone that has ads and the other person that has traffic and be that middleman? And we were doing arbitrage back then, buy low, sell high, right? Really early things like the word mesothelioma, the key word, it was paying like $500 a click back then. Well, with the MySpace traffic, Dude, I was getting that traffic at, at at pennies on the dollar because I had helped them design one of the first social media ads to be able to monetize their traffic that a lot of social media is based on today. And so from that whole process, I mean, we were printing money and I built multiple companies on, I mean, everything you could think of online, right? Every acronym, CPC, CPA, CPL, C, we could go through the whole thing. I learned how to monetize it all. But Justin, one of the biggest things that I, I started being able to do, building all those different companies and, and partnering with people that did what they did well and did what I did well to build, build more, more companies, I realized it was based on a false ideology 
of just trying to generate as much money as possible. And then also not show the, the cracks in what I was, you know, in myself and the mistakes that we had made from falling down and kind of stuff like that. And dude, it led me to a point where, you know, I went through a big reset in my life and it was kind of going through where honestly, outside looking in, I was running 10 different companies, six, seven, and eight figures. Um, but I was become 40 pounds overweight. My relationships were monetary and I had no vision about where I was going. I just knew where I was at. And I remember being in my home office, I had my son, I was trying to be able to change for a lot of the things that I was in, honestly contemplating if I should be on this planet, you know, and, you know, as a dad, you know, you know, as well as I do, like to be able to get in that point where I put business so much that I think that the money is more important than my life being around. It was a huge shift for me. I mean, that office became not only a, a sanctuary for me to escape my life, but a coffin that I was going through. And I mean, a good friend of ours, Jesse Elder, kind of stepped in and was like, and gave me permission to take back my life. And that's kind of where I, I find myself today from that transition, resetting, going through, walking away from everything and going, how do I actually blend true humanity and help people never feel as alone as I did in that digital marketing and to be able to actually humanize the way we are online? Because I think we lost that human touch. Wow. That is... Long story. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's powerful and it's... um you know, it's, it's defining, right? So what, um, what great perspective, what a tough thing to wrestle through, but, uh, to emerge victorious and to find purpose and passion, uh, beyond just work. So that's the big thing is like at a certain point, if you're, um, if your focus, if your meaning is just tied up in what you do, uh, it's, it's not going to serve you long-term. It can serve you for a season and it very well may be a good, uh, time in your life where you need that season where you are dialed in, but big picture, right. long-term, you know, it's gotta be something bigger. And you see this in a lot of, um, professional athletes, um, business owners that sell people that have their identity wrapped up in what they do. Uh, that it's not uh, who they are, it's who they were, or who they're, you know, what their title was, what people know them for. Um, and that's a tough transition for people. Oh, yeah. um, you mentioned Jesse Elder and what a powerful human he is. I mean, um, anyone that has a chance, I just recommended him to a couple of people uh, to coach with, but anyone who has a chance to, to coach with him, that guy is uh, just a magician, a miracle worker. I, I actually don't want to call it magician because that that downplays what it is. Oh, I mean, yeah. he just has tactical strategies that um, are just powerful and they're they're life changing and life giving. So, oh yeah, and I mean, like Justin, I'll tell you, like when I I remember because Jesse was the the new hotness. Like, and this was like ten years ago when I first before I like built a good friendship with him. And I remember I was at that point in my life where I was like, well, I'm just. I'm going to go buy whatever mastermind. I'm going to go hire whatever high coach, like, cause I could, cause I had the money, right. To be able to do it. And I remember going to Jesse, I was like, Oh yeah, well, I, I heard you're the, the new thing. He's like, you know, I'm just, I want to, you know, I want to be part of your next program, be able to go in. This is when he was first really starting to launch some his bigger programs. Um, been forever. And he looks at me, he goes, no, and I was like, no, what do you mean? No, he goes, I don't think you're ready for my program. I'm like, dude, I'm, will, I'm ready to pay. I'm like, this is, I've got the cash. That's all that matters. Like you should let me in. I'm going to be able to, I'm going to level up because, you know, I'm going to buy my way into leveling up and being able to go through. And, and he was like, I just don't think you're ready. And I, after I left, I was sitting there and going, the hell? And I even called and left him a message. And I was like, man, I don't understand what's going on, you know? And then it finally hit me of what I was doing and why. And he didn't respond to my first message. My second message I went in there and I was like, look, I, I get it now. I, I think I went in the wrong way. And I mean, this is one of the best lessons you're already teaching me, being able to shift and go through how my mindset was. And he didn't call me back again, didn't text me back for like six, seven days. And I'm like, and I'm sitting here going, what am I missing? I'm like, I'm not. and the funny thing was, I thought it was a whole ploy that Jesse was doing. But once you know, Jesse, sometimes he just doesn't look at text messages. And like, he gets back to me like seven days later, he's like, Hey man, got your message. Like, you know, I think you're right. I think you're ready. And I'm like, dude, man, you put me through the ringer. He goes, Oh, unintentionally. I just didn't, I, I didn't see your text message yet. 
<laughs> oh, that's so funny. Well, and the great thing about Jesse, I mean, for anyone that that knows him or those that are looking to get to know him, he doesn't really care about money. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so he lives a lifestyle that is just much different than than most of the rest of the people on the planet. And, you know, when he needs to figure those things out, he does, but he lives opportunistically with, you know, what does life hold today? Um, and it's, it's really cool and he's done very well. And it's probably because he's not focused on money. Yeah. That was the biggest shift and it allowed me to be able to see a different path and different light. And I mean, without him and kind of going through Justin, that, that reset, I mean, I remember my lawyers that go like, this is going to take three years because I was, they, man, my, my former thought I was hiding money everywhere, kind of going through. And I said, we can always make more money. We can't make more time. And mm. so at 36, I mean, I closed down all my companies walked away and, you know, to be able to save time, not only for myself, but for my kids, you know, I moved back in with my parents and with a little bit under a thousand dollars, I had not worried about money for like 10 years wow. and, and started over. And I mean, that was, was a big shift for me to be able to go through. And at first I was like, yeah, freeing me able to go through without, you know, having fun, all kind of stuff like that. But I honestly too, didn't realize until I came to a lot of my buddies and I was like, man, I, I think, I'm having some issues and I was actually in a mini depression. I had said, let myself understand, but truly, again, we talk about relationships to kind of pulling that all back. Do once I went back to my relationship said, Hey, this is what I'm going on. And the relationship I built, like, dude, we know we got you life changed the next day and opportunities started opening up again. So it's really powerful on being able to understand, especially as an entrepreneur, don't silo yourself, right? There's so many amazing people, like just the people listening to this podcast are leveled up because they're actually paying attention to other people out there and you're not alone in this world to be able to truly change not only what's around you, but their surroundings for everyone if you actually work with other people. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And so what was next? What, uh, you moved on then from MySpace, you kind of got out of this funk, this depression. Yeah. Uh, what, what was your next move? Dude, I mean, you know, very similar, like a little bit before you met me and we kind of connected and stuff like that. But I mean, this was my time when I was, you know, as the pendulum swings, right? I was, I was going to be a life coach, you know, I was going to teach everyone all the things, all the mistakes that I had, I had made. I mean, I wrote my book, Balance is Bullshit, you know, how to live more of an integrated life, getting rid of this whole work-life balance. I mean, I had my mala beads on. I mean, I was, I was full Zen brother, you know, and it was good, but I realized too, I I wasn't a life coach. I didn't want that aspect. I wanted to be able to help people when I connect people, but it wasn't, I was trying to totally forget all my digital past and go, I'm going to go in a whole different direction. And it wasn't aligned. I didn't find alignment. So I took my new aspect of being able to understand who I was and how that humanness of what we needed was lost online and be able to pair it with that digital world that I had known so well and then that's kind of where my company standard authority was born, right? How to be able to be able to shift perspective, not how to sell someone online, but how do we educate, inspire, and draw them in, have them choose to work with someone. And it really, really blessed me to be able to with some of the people. I started working with some of the men and women I used to read their books on how to be able to start my own companies 20 years ago. Now are my clients and I was helping them really build advocates first online and allow that byproduct to become clients. Very similar, like you said, with Jesse, allowing what he does to be the, the, the main source and allow the byproduct to be money. Right. So that shift was allows me where I am today and it continues. And it just happened to be on a platform that most people don't know how to use, which was LinkedIn. Yeah. And so let's talk about LinkedIn because I remember when it first came out and I was thinking, you know, part of me was like, man, this thing could take over the world. And then part of me is like, uh, is this really going to catch on because Facebook's so big uh, do people really want like a professional network to connect with? And so I, I went back and forth and I remember creating, uh, you know, a profile very early yeah. on. Uh, and I was like, you know what? I think this is going to go somewhere because I can see myself not wanting to connect socially all the time. Like I, th I see this, you know, business opportunity. Now, I didn't necessarily understand the magnitude of how big it would become and that this might become one of the largest recruiting tools in existence, mm -hmm. uh, which is neat. Uh, but I'd love to hear, you know, some of your thoughts because you are the foremost 
um, LinkedIn expert that I know, and uh, you've got a great name, a great reputation in the space. So um, most people that are listening to this, maybe close to everyone listening to this, uh, is in need of some of the expertise that you have that they haven't completely optimized, uh, or even really, in some cases, began the beginning stages of optimization for their LinkedIn profile. So where, mm-hmm. where do you start? You know, that's the whole piece, man. And I appreciate the the question, Justin, because LinkedIn's that, that power platform that people go, oh, it's a place to be able to find a job. Yes, and, right? And this is that biggest thing. Microsoft, a couple of years ago, purchased LinkedIn, one of their largest cash purchases ever. And I mean, it's been one of their highest returns. I mean, they're integrating. I'm going to tell you right now, like anyone going, oh, why LinkedIn? Dude, if you're going to bet against Microsoft, they've been around forever. You're betting on the wrong horse. I mean, they've they've been around for a couple of decades now and continue to be able to have a massive thing and have so many, their fingers in so many different products and services. And that's what they're looking with LinkedIn as well, too. Because of a lot of these things, I mean, your LinkedIn profile, if you're looking for a job, great place to be able to do it. But if you have a high-end product or service that you're, you want to be able to leverage and be able to connect with, do the audience, LinkedIn's audience, right? You look at, like for me, a lot of the clients we work with have high-end products or services, like anywhere from $5,000 to $50,000 offers, right? And then the biggest thing is too, like the average income, right? You look at Twitter, it's about $58,000 a year. Facebook's around $64,000 a year. Any guesses on where LinkedIn's average income is, Justin? Oh gosh, uh, I have no idea. I'm probably, I would probably guess grossly wrong. <laughs> it's about, I'll save you that. It's about $120,000 a year. So, I mean, like, think about that, right? If you have a high-end product or service, you want someone to have a higher disposable income. So if the average income is around 120, that much more than the other platforms, there's massive opportunity to be able to connect. Now, the big thing is most people think, oh, I can just go through and we get it. I hate LinkedIn. I get all the spam messages because every every single person is going in there and they're like, I'm just going to go in and I'm going to spam a thousand people. I get the one sale. Yay. I got the one sale. Right. But you just pissed off 999 people, right? There's a better way to be able to do it. And and that's the kind of whole piece, right? There's a human way. How do we actually make those 999 people that maybe aren't ready for your service advocates? Well, not only how you how you connect with them and build that relationship, it starts with your profile, right? How do you actually humanize that? So many people go in and they're like, oh, hey, there's Joshua B. Lee, CEO of Standout Authority. And like, that's their career. And I'm like, dude, I'm going to tell you right now, I didn't wake up one day. I wasn't born the CEO of Standout Authority, right? I didn't say founder, right? There's so many things that are on there and they forget to be able to tell their, not their job descriptions, but their career journey. Like if you look at my profile, Justin, Dude, it goes all the way back to when I was a server at Chili's. You know how many people go on there and they're like, dude, you worked at Chili's? Me too. Because what I said in the beginning, Justin, was how do we actually start a conversation that creates a relationship and opens up opportunity? If you can't actually go through and put as much on your profile as possible, talk about all your different jobs, being able to go through where you've been, different volunteering experiences, um, different organizations. All that is an opportunity for connection because as human beings, the biggest thing that I look at is I don't care about the Facebook algorithm, Instagram algorithm, how the Twitter, or even I don't care about the LinkedIn algorithm, right? I care about the human algorithm, right? That's the one algorithm that doesn't change every couple of days, every couple of months. It evolves over time. So for me as human beings, just like you and I, we look for commonalities, you know, front row dads, being in business going to the same events, right? That brought you and I together. So that's what I want people to think about on LinkedIn is how can you actually put more things on there to be able to help someone go from knocking on your door, right? Trying to be able to sell you something. So me and Justin sitting on a couch because we have some kind of commonality that we built because of that connection. And we're sitting on a couch and I have to be like, Justin, dude, I got these new AirPods, right? And you'll actually go, dude, tell me more about them. And so that's the thing about LinkedIn is you've got to realize there's a, you have to be human on that platform, even though it's B2B, dude, there's no B2B or B2C. There's only H to H, human to human. Every company is run by another human being. Most marketers just forget that. Yeah, that's good. So basically you're telling me I need to list on my, uh, you know, I guess in my experience that I used to work for Abercrombie and Fitch. Dude, hell yeah. Hey, guess what? 
<laughs> I've heard from my my kids that Abercrombie and Fitch is actually coming back and, and is cool again. I've heard that. I've heard that. I've seen that. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's interesting when you mentioned Chili's, um, it brought up like even just for me, something like if I had seen that, I've got positive association with Chili's because we used to go there a lot when we were younger. And so when I was in high school, uh, I met this girl uh, that worked there and I was like, oh, she is amazing. Uh, and I, you know, kept going back, you know, trying to work up the courage to ask her out and uh, just really became friends with her and eventually invited her to uh, ask her to be my date to my senior prom. So uh, yeah, all through Chili's. So that's the whole thing, right? Like people is. forget to be able to put these little things on there. I mean, it's, it's crazy. And I mean, like, it's not just about building those connections. Like all of us want to be found on the biggest search engine out there, right? Google. Dude, I mean, like, this is why I love LinkedIn because people go, well, you want to get indexed on Google. Everyone's trying to do SEO, trying to be able to do all these other things. Just like Pinterest is a search engine, YouTube is a search engine. LinkedIn's one of the best search engines out there. Google indexes the hell out of it, dude. So mm -hmm. the Moz score, like how actually SEO is ranked based on Google and things of that nature, it's a hundred out of a hundred. So all of those things from the way that you have your profile, your content, all the articles, are highly, highly indexed on Google. So whatever's on your profile, I guarantee you if you put an article on your own company page and then you actually go put that same article or in, on LinkedIn, I guarantee if I search for it, I'm going to find the LinkedIn link before I'll find it on your own page nine times out of 10. That's powerful. That's good to know, especially for people that are trying to create awareness for what they're doing for their company, their investment, their brand, their uh, charity, whatever it is, you know, yeah. what achievements. Um, that's awesome. So uh, tell, tell me more about like, how does your company um, like solve these everyday problems? How does your company uh, help people create a better profile, create more uh, conversion? Um, yeah. You know, I want to learn more about the the ins and outs of what you guys do. Dude, it's it's been fun. I mean, the good thing about what we do is, you know, the people that we work with, yes, they have high-end products or services, but at the same time, the first thing I ever ask anyone, are you adding value to this world? Or are you just trying to monetize it? Because the people I want to work with, I want to help, you know, to get seen and be able to draw people in. Those are the people, right? They're trying to be able to truly change this world for the better. So I've done enough in that in my advertising world, all the other stuff, and I don't think I really helped a lot of people. So as we kind of go through, I mean, one of the biggest things that we start doing is if you've got something new, we kind of come in. We, I was kind of a blast last year. My amazing wife, Rachel Beatley, um, she left corporate. She had been, you know, running branding for the Microsoft Partner Network. Then she was running branding for Gartner Digital Networks. And she left last year and partnered with me at the company and now runs that side of the business for us, you know? So really being able to go in and help someone, one, be able to tell their story, understand their messaging, how their tonality, because for what we do, we come in and say for you, Justin, right? We come in, we learn, understand who you are, what you do, what you stand for, and then help communicate that in a human fashion, right? We're here to be able to help, help you build relationships, right? If someone comes to me and they go, Hey, Josh, I need a thousand leads. Dude, I'm not your guy, right? There's a thousand people behind me that are willing to take your money because that's exactly what they're going to do if you're looking for lead generation on LinkedIn. But if you want to build high-end relationships that create opportunity, that's where we step in because we understand who you're, gonna, who you're trying to target, how to be able to communicate with them. And then funny enough, man, I, I just do the things that my mom taught me how to be able to treat other human beings. We just do it online. It's kind of how I, I got the title of dopamine dealer of LinkedIn, right? Because I mean, that's kind of what we're doing because the average person, when you look on link, LinkedIn online for the last 20, do you, dude, did you ever see the movie uh, um, Social Dilemma? Yeah, oh yeah. So, you know, we've we've been conditioned over the last 20 years basically to be in this, this human algorithm of like, comment, share, post, like, comment, share, post, right? And so one of the biggest things is as we were trained to be able to do that, creating stop gaps in someone's pattern you start as easy as appreciating someone, right? So the things that we do as we go through, appreciate people for taking actions, right? Being able to go in and nurture these relationships, giving compliments, asking about them, then providing value. And I mean, these are just little things that I was taught throughout my own life to be able to do, but you forget to be able to do it on LinkedIn or any other platform. 
And so when someone has that and you start these things, we're doing this organically, right? Helping them create content and engaging with their content, engaging with people that engage with you is, is super powerful. And then we take over and build a relationship and hand off a powerful relationship with that person after building out their profile, understanding their messaging, understanding how to be able to build their content and then who they want to attract rather than who they want to sell. Yeah, that's good. I love it. And on a comical note, is it a requirement that you have B as your middle initial to be able to work there, be a founder, be a partner? It is, it is <laughs> funny, right? Because I mean, like it didn't, it happened by accident. People are like, wow, you're branding with your wife. You're Joshua B. Lee and she's Rachel B. Lee. I'm like, well, one, Josh Lee gets lost and, you know, online. It's not, you know, going through, there's a lot of Josh Lees out there. So I did that. And Rachel's last name was Bronstein. So when we got married, not ever thinking we were going to work together. She just moved that to her middle name and she became Rachel B. Lee. And then we became, as as most people know us online, as the B. Lees. And let's see if I've got it here. And now we've got our community called the, the family. <laughs> That's great. Oh, it's awesome branding. And I've you seen know, you wear your apparel. It's awesome. Dude, I mean, it's it's funny because I finally like leaned into it because, you know, when I had before I had my first two kids, you know, my son, Jaden, and my daughter, Skylar, it was people were like, oh, dude, you should name your kid because the last name of Lee, it sounds like L-Y, like positive Lee, absolutely, you know, and I'm like, dude, I'm so sick of everyone kind of going through, like after a while you hear all your boys going, you know, giving you all these amazing names that they think are like funny as hell. And, you know, finally I, we leaned into it, like, all right, we're, we're going to own the Lee and family was born and kind of going through there because it, it goes through the same things that we want to represent for everyone. Ah, oh, it's so cool. Well, and I, I can relate because my wife did the same thing. She moved her last name to her middle name. So uh, I think that's that's really great for, uh, you know, women that are switching last names to still be able to embrace theirs. Yeah. Um, so let's, uh, let's kind of dive into this newest component of your business because you've recently gotten into crypto and NFTs um, and so I'd love to hear your thought process around some of that branding, uh, because this is the wave of the future, um, especially from a branding standpoint, especially from like a capability standpoint, um, an access standpoint. So talk, talk us through that. Dude, I love that you say that. Cause you know, I hold you with high regard when you're talking about investing in new things like that. Cause I mean, some people go in like, Oh, crypto, you know, it's kind of going through. So for you to even, you know, ascertain of where we're at, where it's going. And I mean, you're saying the same things that Rachel and I see too. It makes me go, yay. Okay. I'm doing something right. Cause Justin's saying the things that I want them to say, because it truly is. It's a next level of branding, right. As you kind of be able to go through and that's where we see, like you have different people. You look at like Nike, right? Like everyone goes through like, dude, I'm an avid Nike collector. Like my wife recently told me I'm not allowed to buy. I'm only allowed one pair of Nikes uh, a month because <laughs> She went and counted my shoes, Justin. She goes, in the last three months, you've bought in 16 different pairs of Nikes. Wow. How many pairs do you own total? I, I think I'm only at like, I've only done this in the recent years. So probably like 35, 40 pairs of Nikes, but I got more hooked on winning them, right? Because like in, in the world of Nike, if you don't get the opportunity to win to buy them now, like two seconds later, they're resold because the branding is so strong a pair of Nikes that you paid a hundred, you would pay 150 for now run four or 500 hell, sometimes a couple thousand dollars being able to go into it, but Nike doesn't reap those benefits. And I think that's the beautiful thing of where it kind of goes to with crypto as they're kind of embracing these things. If you have, you do put in tokenization into it, or you have an NFT associated with it as the brand, as it continues to be able to pass on, the creator gets access and gets to be able to take a percentage back based off of what they've created. And I think that's what we're going to see a lot of these brands creating their own currency within their community. I mean, that's what we did with standard authority. We created the SOA coin. My wife, you know, funny fact, I was like, SOA, yeah, we're going to get a jacket. She goes, I know why you're doing this. Yes, that's the company's standard authority. But I'm, and of course, I thought Sons of Anarchy loved the show. I was like, <laughs> Dude, we're going to create, we're going to create motorcycle jackets. She goes, no, you're not. You, you, there's a level where we, I have to stop you because your ADHD goes off and you're like, Ooh, I'm going to create all this other fun shit. But I mean, that's the thing, man. I mean, what we're doing on that, we created a community and we allowed people to be able to go in and be able to own this coin. And I wanted to shift 
what we were doing for so many years, for 20 years, dude, I've been in this industry. We've been trading money for information, right? And, you know, with masterminds, with everything, with, you know, this, this course, that course, whatever. Yes, it's great. And right. Because what I want to be able to shift or I want to turn those at that, that, that information into assets. And that's what I can see with cryptocurrency, especially in our world, right? We're going in and going, Hey, guess what? If you own, I think it right now is to be able to get access to every masterclass, everything that we've ever done and gone through, it's, you have to hold 300 SOA coins. Now our coins worth about a dollar a coin right now, you know, based on the levels of crypto, but people don't get it either. Just like, wait a minute. So do I buy the coins and then I, I give you the coins back to be able to go in? No, it's utility of owning the coin. You get access into our courses because they're investors, because the more people that actually own the coin, the value of that goes up. And I mean, that's what I'm trying to be able to build is a, not just short term, right? Value and, and being able to sell what's, what's now. I'm looking at where we're going over the future. And I think that's where crypto has the opportunity. So long, somebody probably like, oh, I'm going to create this digital art and I'll put it up. I mean, look, Gary V crushed it with a whole bunch of doodles. And I mean, now those things are worth a crazy amount of money, but we're not going to see the times of the Gary V's being able to do, you know, that we're not going to be able to see the same kind of scenario. If you look at, um, why am I losing board apes? Right. Which funny story. I was actually offered to be on a panel when that launched, when we were doing clubhouse back in the day, I was like, dude, I'm not spending $200 on a stupid, you know, graphic of a gorilla. You know, kind of going through hindsight, That's rough. Being 20, hindsight being 2020, kind of going through the whole thing. But this is where we're going. They have to have utility attached to it. Now, no matter if it's crypto or if it's actually NFTs, as I see the, the power of the creator coin and things of that nature, utility is going to be where everyone has to be able to, you can't just put something out there and we're, we're going to see it change and truly change the way branding is seen for many of these bigger companies. And even for the, the guys like you and I, we can truly create community and opportunity and brand awareness through a, a, a currency that's used within our group. Yeah. And you'll see now, I mean, a lot of these big companies, some of the powerhouses out there uh, have brought in some big teams to kind of create, you know, their own version Their, you know, so for me, I, I saw it before they started doing it, but me seeing them doing it is a great um, just uh, kind of like a, a reassurance that this is the direction that things are headed. And, and by the way, we have a lifestyle investor NFT and we haven't built out all the functionality on it, but for anyone that owns a brand, it really is a no brainer to put something like this together because you can create something that gives a certain amount of access. You can have different coins, different levels. You can have it for founding members. You can have it for uh, existing members, new members. You can have different levels for the tiers that people get access to. Um, but then you can build in. So like with ours, um, anytime it gets sold, there's an extra 10% uh, that goes back to, um, you know, the lifestyle investor uh, brand and company itself. And so a lot of the, the people in this space are able to do that. And there's a way to monetize every transaction that happens. Oh, yeah, dude. And, and I didn't know that you had NFT. So now after this, you need to text me and make sure I can go pick one up if they're they're readily available somewhere. Cause I mean, I definitely want to be able to own one, dude. It's uh, I recently, I was very excited. I, I got um, Bill Murray launched a uh, NFT with the chive here in Austin and I missed the first round on it. And it was going for um, 1.5 ETH, the first ones. And I mean, dude, like overnight, cause what he did was he did this first, he's doing a thousand. He's attaching one of Bill Murray's stories to the NFT. So you actually own one of his stories when you get the NFT. So that's the utility. That's and cool. there's going to be other things that are involved with that, being able to meet him and stuff like that. But they went from 1.5 ETH to, I think the, the, the top one right now is 400 ETH. I mean, like overnight, crazy wow. investment, but I mean, those are the things, I mean, think about once he passes too, but I did get second round. So I just picked up my, my Bill Murray NFT. And I mean, but this is the whole thing, right? It's that brand. Like I remember growing up with it, you know, watching Caddyshack and, and Ghostbusters and all these other things. And that's what we're seeing brands be able to do. And I think we're going to start seeing a lot of personalities start being able to leverage this too, just like you are. Yeah, it's it's incredible, the opportunity here. And and right now we're only, you know, we're, we're like scratching the surface. So we're ours are only, 
Yeah, we're, we're, <laughs> that's right. We're, we're only for members right now, but we are going to be expanding, you know, our NFT uh, nice. optionality. There, there's a lot of stuff that we've considered and looked at, but we definitely wanted some exclusivity in our beginning NFTs and, and access. And, uh, you know, that's some awesome. of these beginning ones, the founding members are just highly valuable. We, I love seeing like people uh, selling them on OpenSea. Uh, you know, it's like, whoa, you're listing that one for a million bucks. That's cool. Um, so, and someone else I got to introduce you to is uh, my friend, Mitch Johnson. So Mitch is um, the head of Keller Capital. So he is, yeah. he basically manages and invests Gary Keller of Keller Williams, his, yeah. his money uh, and his just incredible track record, but he has a shoe collection like no other. I mean, this guy uh, has some of the coolest sneakers out there and, and is a true collector. So I think you guys have a lot of fun. Uh, he has socks, like a sock collection sells socks. He's an investor in a bunch of things. Uh, uh, if you're familiar with, um, uh, the collective, uh, oh, yeah. so he's, oh, yeah. uh, and, and you know, some of the people that are kind of in the space up above back in, in, uh, the office back there. So some of that apparel up front, uh, oh, in that, man location is is his he's a part of it's those fun things right like we can go through and be able to do things like for me like the shoe side it's playing like me my wife goes in she's like she's like i don't know why you're buying it. like you don't leave the house half the time and like you're you're no one's seeing your nikes i'm like i see them i like them when i leave the house someone else might see them. and every single time we're like oh dude i love your kicks i'm like i look at her and i go see see <laughs> <laughs> that's great well uh this has been awesome josh uh, i feel like we could talk you know yeah. for hours more but uh where can uh people learn more about you and more about your your brand dude i mean like of course you can go to standardauthority.com but what i'd love everyone to do because again it builds a better relationship for you and i and i get to know them as well too How, please connect with me on linkedin right find me joshua b lee and then tell me why you why you love Justin, right? Why you listen to his podcast? What's going on? Because if you give me that story and send me a personal message, don't just send me that blank connection request because I'll be honest, I'm not doing like most people on LinkedIn playing Pokemon, trying to catch them all. Like I'm trying to build those relationships. So if you send me a message on why you listen to Justin's podcast, why you love him, I can actually tell Justin like, dude, look at all these amazing messages that are kind of going through. So that's the best way to do well, that's cool. I love that. And I mean, here and everything you talked about today, I'm like, man, uh, you and I need to be working together uh, because I know I'm falling short Anytime. probably in every social media avenue because I don't really care about it all that much. And I just uh, want to live life inside of real life, not social media life. But, uh, you know, in today's day and age, there's an argument to be made that that really needs to be um, operated at a high level. Oh, I just you know, Justin, brother, I mean, you know, I, I love you and everything like that. I mean, like, that's the biggest thing. Like you continue to be able to change and add value to me. Cause I get, I know you, but I mean, I look at my past, like when I first started, I had the opportunity to be able to step in front of the curtain a lot more and change the way and be able to talk about what I thought Google was doing at the time that I didn't believe in. And I was like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to sit back. The more that men like you and I are in front of the curtain, sharing, being able to allowing, even though it might not be where we feel called specifically on social media, the more that we're able to actually go out there, educate, inspire, and draw people in, the more that we're going to be able to change this world for the better, not only for you and I, not only for our own kids, but for their kids in the next generations. Mm, I love it. Well, thank you for joining us. And I like to end every episode by asking our listeners just a simple question. It's this one. What's one step that you can take today to move towards financial freedom and living a life you truly desire on your terms, not by default, but by design? We'll catch you next week.